all right this is gonna be the Nyaya Vashashika system and this is a, a school of Hindu realism this is their take on creation or what I would call this self-creation and the words universe are used in this uh, text but we have to remember what the universe is which is basically our world system I will call it a sphere uh, we are on the uh, plane of terra firma and water uh, sea level and we have the uh, stars and wandering stars the sun and moon in the firmament inside of our world system our sphere of life and the spheres of life or our sphere of life at least exist within primordial waters so this is their take on its constitution or its uh, condition or the fact that there is necessarily not a beginning point there is no creation of a universe that is to say an orderly arrangement of things into a system which is absolutely the first creation so here they're gonna state how the beginning point hypothesis is not necessarily logical the beginning of a universe means the beginning of a system only which under no circumstances is the first and only one created on the contrary it is merely one of a beginningless series so these universes come and go uh, they talk about creation and destruction uh, perpetually thus the present universe as we find it today had a beginning there was another before it and if that one came into existence at some point in time there had been another which had preceded it and so on this beginningless series of universes is called samsara and that's what you hear in Buddhism samsara this is the uh, Nyaya Vashashik system but again a lot of those terms again because uh, Buddhism comes out of uh, Hinduism but samsara is the constant moving on or basically they would consider it constant uh, being born and dying uh, constant birth and death this is the world of samsara so that samsara is beginningless can be supported as follows so here's their reasons they break down different points of why it must be beginningless an absolutely first beginning of the universal process can mean only one or other of the following alternatives so here are the three cases for why or how you could say the universe has a first point they're gonna list three alternatives the first is that it was a first molding or fashioning of their own accord as the universe of the ingredients which were already existent and had been existing forever without a beginning so like when we say the primordial waters they're saying okay uh, there's the case where you'll say that uh, the waters were just steady or whatever and as suddenly you know they decided to uh, coagulate in like Egyptians say uh, it became conscious at one point and they decided to uh, form these spheres these bubbles of air within these bubbles they decided to uh, transform into the world world systems but the second is that such eternally existing ingredients are molded into the universe by an intelligent being so this is similar to uh, the Bible, uh, the biblical story of creation, where it says in the beginning, uh, you know, God moved his face over the waters. Now, a good question would be, then what created the waters if God moved his face over the waters? But of course, that could be a metaphor, an allegory, but they're going to go into that. The third is that it was created by an intelligent being out of nothing. That's also part of the biblical story, too. In the beginning, there was nothing. So... In the first alternative, the stuff must have existed forever. In the second, not only the stuff, but the being who molded it into the universe must have existed forever. And in the third alternative, it is the being that must have existed from all eternity. In any case, it must be admitted that something had existed from eternity and prior to the creation of the universe. Now, the age of the universe, however long, is yet limited and must have begun on the theory of a first creation at a definite point of time in the past, however remote. And this age, however, is surely insignificantly small as compared with the beginningless, that is, the eternal duration of the stuff 
or of the being that is God as such a being will be called. So our current cycle or whatever you want to call it, is very insignificantly small compared to the beginninglessness of the universe, I'll say, or this, uh, call it a creation here. It will be seen that on none of the three alternatives can the first beginning of the universe be maintained. So here's where they dispute these uh, premises. On the first theory, namely the stuff fashioning itself of its own accord into the universe, we have to ask if this stuff is something intelligent, that is, can start movements by itself, or if it is of the nature of inert matter. So in the first case, if it's intelligent, it will not be very different from the being of the second theory, which we shall deal with directly. So they're saying if, if the matter is intelligent, that's not much different from saying God. So they're including this concept of God inside of materialism also, because of course, if we say that the uh, primordial waters are themselves intelligent, then we have to say, well, they are God in a sense. So in the second case, inert matter how can an inert something start a new movement by itself no inert matter can possibly start movements of its own accord and as nothing can be shown to have come so to say from outside to operate on the inert stuff and thus produce movement it must be concluded that there have been always movements in this stuff and therefore there has always been a creation a molding of the universe so basically what they're saying is this stuff of the universe these primordial waters must have always been creating and destroying um because they're eternal um it couldn't have come from one moment where they decided to awaken because we're talking about uh, eternity here so they say if you're gonna say suddenly it became awake that wouldn't make sense um then they'll go into how if it did do that then of course that would be god um, otherwise, if it didn't, if it was just inert, then it would just stay inert. So they say, well, the only alternative leaves us to say that, well, it must be beginningless. This stuff, this primordial waters, must have always been in creation and destruction, in motion or movement, as they call it. On the second and third theories, namely of a being that is God having molded the universe out of eternally existing stuff, or of creating the universe out of nothing, we have to ask, is this molding or creative activity essential to God or merely accidental? If it is essential, then it has existed eternally with God, for nothing that is essential to a thing can be conceived as being ever absent from it. So if it's a basically intrinsic aspect of this God, creator God, then um, why have a first point? He must have always had this potential. And if the molding or creative activity has always been with God, then the universe also has always existed as a result of this activity. Nor will it do to say that while activity is no doubt essential to God, it had existed from all eternity as a potentiality. So to even say it was just a potential and one day he decided to use it is kind of suspect. And that only at a certain point in the remote past it began showing itself as an actual process. For even then it will have to be explained how a something which had existed from all eternity as a potentiality could suddenly manifest itself as an actuality. In other words, eternity is not necessarily linear. Like um, people think eternity is like, let's just say A to Z, 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 or whatever, or A, 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 A to Z, 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 just infinitely. Like even that's not eternity. Uh, eternity would actually be one. It's not the same as thinking linearly. So they're saying, well, how, you can't say at one point this potential became actuality and turned into a creation, but God exists eternally. Um, well, eternally is not, you, you, you're better off saying, well, God is just real, real old, <laughs> you know, because then you can you know, postulate that first creation uh, choice. And as this cannot very well be explained, we must maintain that the creative or molding activity if it is at all essential to God, has always existed as an actuality and not as a potentiality. If, however, it be held that the activity is not essential to God, but only accidental, then he must have come by it at the time when he began molding or creating the universe. But how, whence, and in what way did he come by it? There is hardly any reasonable way of showing our being that I remain perfectly satisfied without activity from all eternity could suddenly start creating a universe. So that's the postulation when some people speculate 
they automatically assume uh, God or being as God. Well, then they have to say that this being must have existed first. So now you're picturing this, this God or whatever, however you want to picture it, maybe as a big ball of light and um, then push the button or um, from within himself, the universe sprung. But they're saying that's not, that doesn't make logical sense. That a being could have remained perfectly satisfied without activity from eternity and suddenly start creating a universe because this is eternity. Remember, it's a different thing. You can't say an eternal being decided one day. That's what they're uh, debunking, that concept. Even if we grant that God, not being unintelligent matter, could make such a sudden resolve, our difficulties are not solved. For unless we dogmatically assume that in the beginning all were created alike, we cannot maintain without contradiction that God, who is conceived as a moral and just being, could possibly ever have created a world so full of partiality and suffering. So now they're uh, attacking them from the premise of this wise, intelligent being like, um, let's say, Brahma for the Hindus or even um, the so-called good God of the Bible, Allah, um, just to use those popular concepts. Given the traits that they describe, that can't be Allah. They're saying, because look at this world, um, things are not created equally. Um, so you're saying this is a moral and just being, but the world is full of partiality and suffering. Selfishness, uh, partiality, of course, is selfishness and suffering. It's intrinsic to the world. So clearly that God that you point to and want me to worship and praise on top of believing um, of the fact that it was a creator, that suspect, given the conditions. That's why a lot of atheists go, a go full blown atheists, too. Especially Western, uh, you know, nations, you know, reacting to Christianity and such because of uh, this this description given of this God doesn't match up with daily ex existence. So nor is the contradiction removed by saying that God created all beings equal and endowed them with free will and that they, by their free choice, made themselves happy or miserable, good or bad. For then the question will be, why did he give free will to created beings and thus make them behave one way or another so as to bring suffering and wickedness into this world. See, they're going into the, uh, the Odyssey, basically. Um, they're trying to explain, again, you're talking about this guy, but what about the evil? What about the wickedness of the world? How do you explain that? God is regarded as omniscient, and he must therefore have known the disastrous consequences which his gift of free will was going to produce in the world. So that's what you get in Christianity, this free will thing. Um, why did God give us free will then? Huh? So, um, but they're saying, oh, but hold up. He's omniscient. He knows everything. Well, if he knew everything, he would have known his place was going to be fucked up. So, uh, just given those attributes that you uh, tie in with the concept of God, this can't be the God is what they're saying. So, even they're saying this. As a matter of fact, however, God cannot possibly be conceived as having created these sufferings or enjoying beings, or as they would be called, souls, if they are regarded as everlasting for nothing that is created or produced can possibly last forever so the soul concept of being the, this immortal soul concept how could a god create the immortal soul because of course anything created is destroyed that's not immortal there is no known example of it nor can the souls themselves be brought forward as examples of such produced but everlasting things for that is just what will be disputed and will have to be proved. And a thing which has to be proved cannot be brought forward as an instance of ascertained truth. So that's what he's saying. Um, until you can prove that any something produced can be everlasting, then um, that makes no sense. Moreover, we have seen that the real experiencers, that is to say the Atmans, must be eternal, uncreate, and immortal. So this is their concept. They have the Atman too. I went over uh, Buddha's concept of Anatman. And Anatman doesn't mean there is no Atman. He's telling you everything that's not Atman, which is basically the temporal, you know, persona, body self. Brain, gut brain. We have three brains, so to speak, in the body. He was laying out precisely what Atman was not because people were confusing Atman with themselves or part of themselves as individuals. But he's saying the Atmans must be eternal, uncreate, and immortal. 
and I'll probably do something more on the Atmans also, their concept of Atman. But even granting for the sake of argument that they are created by God and endowed with free will, our difficulties are not removed, for even then we cannot hold God to be just, impartial, and free from cruelty, if not positively merciful. If we maintain that he created or molded this universe for the first time and made it without any reason, full of suffering and partiality. So there they go again. They're going back until that, like, hold up. And this is where the Gnostic premise comes in also. This is what I tell you, uh, you know, Gnosticism, they're just blunt about it, but you get this also. This is Hindu realism. They're saying the same thing, how this world is full of suffering and selfishness. From its, uh, intrinsically, like, it's not just man's free will. Like, this whole other world is so, like I said, from every level, really. Um, you know, because even plants have wars and such, you know, so... This is the partiality, the selfishness of it. It's built into it. So they're saying this definitely is not the God that, like the Vedas, you know, they have, you, a lot of people will see like these, the, the blue guy, <laughs> the blue guy with the gold uh, ornaments and everything on. It's like, who is this person? Like, this can't be the same guy who created this place. That's what they're saying. This can't be the same concept that manifested this place. It could just be, or... It would be more likely to consider it cruel like they say uh you know it can't be just it can't be impartial and it can't be uncruel because this world is full of partiality and suffering so all such objections and contradictions are removed entirely as we shall see if we accept the view that the universal manifestation never began but that it is and has forever been and that in short it is an eternal process which has gone on forever and ever this beginningless process of universal manifestation or series of universes is called, as said before, samsara. Peace. Third alternative, it is the being that must have existed from all eternity. In any case, it must be admitted that something had existed from eternity and prior to the creation of the universe. Now, the age of the universe, however long, is yet limited and must have begun on the theory of a first creation at a definite point of time in the past, however remote. And this age, however, is surely insignificantly small as compared with the beginningless, that is, the eternal duration of the stuff, or of the being, that is, God, as such a being will be called. So, our current cycle, or whatever you want to call it, is very insignificantly small compared to the beginninglessness of the universe, I'll say, or this, um, you call it a creation here. It will be seen that on none of the three alternatives can a first beginning of the universe be maintained. So here's where they dispute these uh, premises. On the first theory, namely the stuff fashioning itself of its own accord into the universe, we have to ask if this stuff is something intelligent, that is, can start movements by itself, or if it is of the nature of inert matter. So in the first case, if it's intelligent, it will not be very different from the being of the second theory which we shall deal with directly. So they're saying if, if the matter is intelligent, that's not much different from saying God. So they're including this concept of God inside of materialism also because no circumstances is the first and only one created. On the contrary, it is merely one of a beginningless series. So these universes come and go. Uh, they talk about creation and destruction uh, perpetually. Thus, the present universe as we find it today had a beginning, there was another before it, and if that one came into existence at some point in time, there had been another which had preceded it, and so on. This beginningless series of universes is called samsara, and that's what you hear in Buddhism, samsara. This is the uh, Nyaya Vasha Sikh system, but again, a lot of those terms, again, because uh, Buddhism comes out of uh, Hinduism. But samsara is the constant moving on, or basically, they would consider it constant uh, being born and dying, uh, constant birth and death. This is the world of samsara. So, that samsara is beginningless can be supported as follows. So, here's their reasons. They break down different points of why it must be beginningless. An absolutely first beginning of the universal process can mean only one or other of the following alternatives. So here are the three cases for why or how you could say the universe has a first point. They're going to list three alternatives. The first 
is that it was a first molding or fashioning of their own accord as a universe of the ingredients. Of course, if we say that the uh, primordial waters are themselves intelligent, then we have to say, well, they are God in a sense. So in the second case, inert matter, how can an inert something start a new movement by itself? No inert matter can possibly start movements of its own accord. And as nothing can be shown to have come, so to say, from outside to operate on the inert stuff and thus produce movement, it must be concluded that there have been always movements in this stuff. And therefore, there has always been a creation, a molding of the universe. So basically what they're saying is this stuff of the universe, these primordial waters must have always been creating and destroying um, because they're eternal. Um, it couldn't have come from one moment where they decided to awaken because we're talking about uh, eternity here. So they say if you're going to say suddenly it became awake, that wouldn't make sense. Um, then they'll go into how if it did do that, then of course that would be God. Um, otherwise, if it didn't, if it was just inert, then it would just stay inert. So they say, well, the only alternative leaves us to say that, well, it must be beginningless. This stuff primordial waters must have always been in creation and destruction in motion or movement as they call it on the second and third theories namely of a being that is God having molded against which were already existent and had been existing forever without a beginning so like if we say the primordial waters they're saying okay uh, there's the case where you'll say that uh, the waters were just steady or whatever and as suddenly, you know, they decided to uh, coagulate and like Egyptians say, uh, it became conscious at one point and they decided to uh, form these spheres, these bubbles of air within these bubbles, they decided to uh, transform into the world, world systems. Well, the second is that such eternally existing ingredients are molded into the universe by an intelligent being. So this is similar to uh, the Bible, uh, the biblical story of creation, where it says in the beginning, uh, you know, God moved his face over the waters. Now, a good question would be, then what created the waters if God moved his face over the waters? But of course, that could be a metaphor, an allegory, but they're going to go into that. The third is that it was created by an intelligent being out of nothing. That's also part of the biblical story, too. In the beginning, there was nothing. So... In the first alternative, the stuff must have existed forever. In the second, not only the stuff, but the being who molded it into the universe must have existed forever. And in the... Alright, this is going to be the Nyaya Vashashika system. And this is a, a school of Hindu realism. This is their take on creation, or what I would call this self-creation. And the words universe are used in this uh, text but we have to remember what the universe is which is basically our world system I will call it a sphere uh, we are on the uh, plane of terra firma and water uh, sea level and we have the uh, stars and wandering stars the Sun and moon in the firmament inside of our world system our sphere of life and the spheres of life or our sphere of life at least exists within primordial waters so this is their take on its constitution or its uh, condition or the fact that there is necessarily not a beginning point there is no creation of a universe that is to say an orderly arrangement of things into a system which is absolutely the first creation so here they're going to state how the beginning point hypothesis is not necessarily logical. The beginning of a universe means the beginning of a system only, which under 